Over the last couple of months, uh, at the end of each month, we've been taking a portion of the passage on the screen here, John 14 and verse 6, and we've been preaching on it. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And this is the third month, so we're going to be looking at the third part of that claim. Jesus is the life. If you noticed in the passage that Macy read, John chapter 10, I uh, wish we had time to, to look at all of it, but uh, he's using a, a, the biblical image for rulers or for kings or leaders. He calls them shepherds here. And Jesus is contrasting himself with others who are shepherd pretenders, uh, people who promise that they can help you, people who promise life to protect your life, to enrich your life, to prolong your life. But what does Jesus call them here in this text? He says they're, they're thieves. He says that they're robbers. Your version might say brigands because they end up actually taking your life away instead of saving it. They end up exploiting you to benefit themselves only to run off really when you need them, when danger comes, right? The wolf. And there are many people like that who want us to follow them, but who can't actually help us. And they run off at the first sign of danger. And you know, a lot of them are religious. So here we are. They promise freedom only to lead people into war or more confusion or suffering or slavery. And so the world continues to seek its political saviors. This is the one that will save us. It's spiritual gurus who, they're the ones who have the truth and where we can be enlightened. The pseudo-messiahs only to learn too late that they blatantly confiscate what is not theirs because they come only to steal. Ruthlessly trample human life because they come only to kill and contemptuously deface everything of value because they come only to destroy. So what makes Jesus unique? What makes his claim to life different than those who have come before him or for that matter, those who have come since? Well, this lesson is super simple. Let me give you three basic reasons why Jesus can make this claim and why we can trust him to deliver on it. Number one, Jesus is the source of all life in the universe. The eternal word generated cosmic life. Do you know, if it weren't for Jesus, none of us would be here. And I don't mean like here in the church building because we're worshiping God. No, be here at all, living, existing, breathing, taking up space in the universe. All of life comes from him because he is God's agent of creation, the eternal word of God through which the entire universe came into existence. And this is one of the primary reasons why we don't just do what many people do and honor and respect Jesus and listen to what he says. No, we do more than that. We worship him. He's worthy of our praise and our worship. Look at how John begins uh, his, the fourth gospel here. Uh, John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, you can't read that if you've read the Bible and not think of Genesis chapter 1, right? He's intentionally drawing our minds back to creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what was God's agent in creation? What was the vehicle of, uh, of creation? Well, it was His Word, right? He spoke and he commands reality with the power of his word. He says in Genesis 1, 3, 
let there be light, and the next thing it just says, and there was light. That's the power of God's Word. So the Word, which was active in the beginning, sending life and light into the world, John says, is none other than Jesus Christ before His incarnation. Now we'll get to this a little bit later, but the Word then becomes flesh in verse 14 and dwelt among us. So to uh, a, a, a Jewish person, wisdom was God's instrument. Wisdom, Proverbs 8.30 says, was the craftsman, right, through which God made the world. Now to pagans, many of them, uh, the word was this, or logos, was this divine principle of rationality. And it's, it's that, that secret magic formula that ties everything together in the universe. And so to find meaning and purpose in life means getting in touch with that, that uh, principle. Well, what is John doing here? He's, he's kind of joining the Jewish and the Greek ideas together. He's honing the one and he's correcting the other, isn't he? The word, this logos, is the Greek word for it, is God's wisdom through which he created the world embodied. It's no abstract principle, it's a person. It's a him. And all of life flows from him. He states this both positively and negatively in verses 3 and 4 of our text. He says, all things were made through him, positively, and without him was not anything made that was made, negatively. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So because this word existed eternally with God and was God, life itself is bound up within him. So Paul would put it this way when he wrote to the Colossians. He says, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There are sweeping implications for us as we consider these words. First of all, it answers the question of where we came from, right? About origin. Life came into existence by him. Therefore, to know him is to know where you come from. So what does that tell us? That we have a beginning. We, have, we are creatures. We are contingent entities that might not have existed if it weren't for God. Right? And we owe our existence to Him. So to know where we come from is also helpful to know what we exist for. So it answers our purpose. Life is meant to be for him. It comes into existence by him, and it's all for him. He is preeminent. He is before all things. Before in what way? Before in every way, right? Before in time, certainly, but also before in rank. So he's the purpose. He's the goal of all of life, your life and my life too. Therefore, to live, to truly live, means living for Him. And then there's this wonderful phrase that all things are held together by Him. So not only does life come from Him, and not only do we exist for Him, but all of life is continually upheld by Him. That verb is in the perfect tense, meaning always, all the time. So don't think that, you know, God in the beginning, He just sort of created things, He kind of wound it up like a clock, and He's just letting it run out. No. All of life is sustained moment by moment by Him. Creation cannot exist without Him. All of life depends on Him every day. Think about this psalm, which kind of ce celebrates this, uh, this aspect of dependency, creation's dependency upon God. Psalm 104 Wish we had time to read all of it. But he's talking about all the various things in creation, trees and, 
and animals and nature and weather and mountains and streams and waterfalls and birds and everything else. And he says in verse 27, these all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you give it to them, uh, when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they're dismayed. When you take away their breath or their spirit, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. You see the intimacy and the involvement that the word has in life on a day-to-day -day basis. All of life, the vast complexity of life from the largest star to the tiniest microscopic organism, all of its finely tuned, interconnected, interdependent conditions that make life possible. Gravitational forces, uh, the rate of expansion in the universe, the size of atoms, all the complexity of molecular life, DNA, the balancing of the seasons, all the stuff that you see on a nature documentary when they don't mention God, all of that stuff is held together by the Word. He sustains it. So, we come to understand life's origin, where you come from. We come to understand its purpose, what you are for, and its contingency, our dependence, by coming to Jesus, by knowing Him. Therefore, to choose to know Jesus is to choose life itself. Jesus prayed uh, in John 17 that they would know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. So to refuse to know Jesus is to effectively choose what? Death, right? Look how John puts it not in his gospel, but in his first letter. 1 John chapter 5, in verse 11, he says, This is the testimony, this is the message that we want you to get, that God gave us eternal life, and that this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So what's Jesus' desire? His desire is for us to have life. That's why he came, to give us life. Do you remember what uh, Macy read in, in John chapter 10? Yeah. That they might not just have life, but have it what? More abundantly he says in verse 10. Now, the abundance of life is not just more in terms of quality or quantity, you know, merely uh, everlasting life, but more in terms of substance, right? A fullness of life. He came that we would have a life that's actually worth living. So that's the first thing, the source of life in the universe, the eternal word generated cosmic life. And then the sharing of life on the earth, the suffering servant experienced human life. You see, instead of just telling us what life is, he showed us what it means to be human. He showed us what life is. The eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us. We call this the incarnation. It's the moment when the eternal word stepped into time he is God with us, Emmanuel. Now, we as Christians, you need to appreciate the fact that there's no other religion like that, where it has its God not just coming down from heaven to earth, but coming down in the form of a human being who would serve and give his life. So the artist became a stroke of paint on his own canvas. The potter became a slab of clay on his own wheel. The creator journeyed from heaven to earth to enter into and become a part of his own creation. That's staggering. Our minds aren't big enough to comprehend that. The source of all life voluntarily chose to bind himself to the human race with all of its limitations. The source of all light chose to enter the darkness of his mother's womb 
and then to see the very light that he created in the beginning for the first time through the unfocused eyes of a newborn. He who is the very word of God, the source of all language and communication, had to learn how to speak and formulate words with an unskilled mouth. He who never knew physical hunger or fatigue or weakness chose to be subject to all of these human frailties. He came to share our life on the earth from inside the womb all the way to the tomb, the whole gamut of human experience. So God sending his son into the world was essential for at least three reasons. First of all, to demonstrate what this abundant life is. Jesus came not just to give us life, but to show us what it means to live a fulfilled life, an abundant life. What does that look like? Well, what kind of life did Jesus live? Would you call it the good life? How we usually use the term? No, of course not, right? But it was abundant. It was complete. It was full. It was human to the core. He values relationships above stuff, right? Jesus possessed very little, and yet he is loved and he loves millions who relate to him personally. And he warned us against thinking that life is about the abundance of possessions, that life is about having more, get as much as you can while you can. He taught us that Abundant life, true life, values mercy above sacrifice. To Jesus, a heart of compassion was more valuable than outward religious observance. It's not to say that the mechanics of worship are unimportant. They are important, but they're irrelevant if our heart isn't in the right place. So he was hanging out with all the wrong people. Tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, sinners even making friends with them, reaching out to them, showing compassion to them, and he's getting flack for it. And so he responds by saying, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I didn't come to call you righteous people. I came to call sinners to repentance. The true life values service above status. He disproved the myth that status and power and popularity are the way to a fulfilled life. Though he was wiser and greater and more powerful than anyone else, the Son of Man didn't come to be served by others. He came to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. He showed us that we ought to value giving above getting. He proved that generosity produces life where greed and envy bring death. As Paul said to the Corinthians, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And he valued love above everything else. He taught us that a life lived for God, loving God, no matter the cost, is to have everything worth having. While a life lived for self, even if we gained the entire world, would be an absolute waste and a disaster. So abundant life is centered on living for God. Those of you kids who were studying the book of Deuteronomy, do you remember what Moses said at the end of the book in chapter 30? He's got the commandments of God, living for God, and what does he say? I'm putting life and death before you. Choose life. Choose a life, in other words, that's going to follow the Lord. So he came to demonstrate abundant life. He came to undergo human suffering with us. I won't repeat everything that Grant said at the table here, but God already knew what it meant to suffer, right? God suffered the pain of a creator for his ruined creation in Genesis chapter 6 when he looked at humanity destroying itself and it grieved him in his heart. God suffered the pain of a husband for a faithless wife or the pain of a a father for his rebellious son when he saw Israel continually rebuff his kindness and his love. They kept on. The more, Hosea says, the more uh, kind and gracious he was to them, the more he loved them, the more they turned away from him. God knows what it's like to suffer. He says in Isaiah chapter 63, 
when his people suffer, he suffers. He says, in all their affliction, he is afflicted. So we serve a sympathetic, affectionate, tender-hearted God. But when the Word became flesh, well, God experienced suffering in a new way. He experienced it from our perspective for the first time. He became like us in every respect. He shared in flesh and blood so that he could be tempted in all points as we are, yet he did it without sinning. This makes him sympathetic. So when we suffer, you know, we often feel that, as Grant said, you know, God is distant, he doesn't care about us, but this could not be further from the truth. He feels every blow that you do, every insult, every rejection, every disappointment, every loss. Why? So that we know we're praying to a God who cares and who hears our cries with compassion. And God sent His Son, thirdly, to manifest divine love toward us. What does he, uh, John say in 1 John 4, 9? In this the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did He choose a lowly birth? Because He loves me so, right, as the song says. So Jesus shared our life on earth to teach us what life is about, to be subject to human suffering himself, and to manifest God's love to us, ultimately, so that we might live through him. So how can we live through him? So our third point, we come to the cross, the sacrifice of life on the cross, the atoning lamb who supplied spiritual life. And this is what we've got to wrap our minds around this morning is that in order for us to live, Jesus had to die. Listen to what he says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. What is he talking about with this serpent business? Well, in the Bible, the serpent is seen as a powerful negative force. It symbolizes the evil within the world. We see Satan taking the form of a serpent on page 3. But it's not just evil within the world. There's an evil within us, too. And this passage gives us the solution to that evil. So the first verse there on the screen, verse 14, it looks back to a story in the book of Numbers. When Israel was wandering in the wilderness, they rebelled against God, and they were punished by these poisonous snakes that had come into their camp, and they were biting them, and they were dying. And God gave Moses the remedy for the poison. He said, for him to make a serpent out of bronze and put it on a pole and you hold it up and anyone who looks up to that serpent on the pole would be healed of that poison. And we see, you know, the, the serpent on a pole is still kind of a, a symbol, right, in the medical community today. You see it on ambulances and stuff like that. Well, the serpent, that bronze serpent, was later stored in the temple. And then, wonder of wonders, Israel started worshiping that serpent. And so Hezekiah, he breaks it into a bunch of pieces because it wasn't the serpent who saved them. It was God. Well, what does this story have to do with Jesus? Well, Jesus says, this is pointing to me. This is pointing to my death on the cross. Like Israel, all of humanity, you and me, we're poisoned. Something has gone wrong with us, deep down within each one of us. Why are we the way that we are? Sure, we, we can be good. Sure, we have capacity for goodness. But we're nowhere near as good as we ought to be. Why is there this, this corruption? Something has gone wrong so deep within us that now, even though we have physical life, we're living in a state of spiritual death. And like Israel, the only cure is to look, not to the serpent, but to look to the Son of Man, Jesus, in faith when He is lifted up. When would Jesus be lifted up? On the cross, 
In the cross, we see two immutable aspects of God's character joined perfectly together, his justice and his love. We see his justice against evil. When Jesus was crucified, we see the evil which was and is in the world and is within us. When Jesus died on the cross, God allows that evil to take out its full force on him. And when we see Jesus crucified on the cross, we're seeing what true evil is capable of. And his execution was the most unjust act in human history, and yet God incorporated that ultimate act of evil into his eternal plan to be the ultimate triumph, as if he were luring sin all into one place, the body of Christ on the cross, where it could exhaust itself and God's wrath could be spent upon him. So we also see not just justice, not just wrath against sin, but we see the full expression, the dramatic display of God's love towards sinners. So the crucifixion wasn't just some messy accident that happened in the corner of the world sometime, nor was it just God letting the worst thing happen to somebody else. Go back to the beginning of the lesson. The eternal Word stepped into time and became flesh. It was the Word who was with God and who was God who was dying. It was God giving Himself in the flesh, dying under the weight of your sin and my sin. And He condemned sin in His body on the cross. And all at once, God's wrath was spent and His love was revealed. That's how much God loves each one of us. That's how much God wants us to live, that He gave His own life. So how can the sacrifice of Jesus reach us today? Well, the evil within us isn't just cured automatically because he died 2,000 years ago. For the healing to take place, to avoid perishing and receive eternal life, what does John 3 say? We've got to be part of the process, not just by trying harder to be like Jesus. All we can do is, like the Israelites, is to look to him and trust him, believe in him, now, in the Gospel of John, that belief carries with it the idea of obedient trust and submission to Him. Like sheep, all of us have gone astray. But when we return to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls, the one who laid down His life for us in order to protect us, we find life itself. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds, we have been healed. And despite appearances, Jesus' life was not taken from Him against His will. Now, John 10 says that He laid it down. He has the authority to lay His life down, and He has authority to take it up again. And so we can't talk about the cross without talking about the resurrection his death on the cross only makes sense in light of the resurrection three days later. There's a story we don't have time to talk about, but one of Jesus' best friends died. And Lazarus and his sisters were weeping at the tomb, and he was talking to one of the sisters. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So when we turn to him in faith, coming to him on his terms, in other words, we don't have to fear physical death because we're given spiritual life, eternal life. Listen to what Jesus says about those who believe in him in John 5. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He does not suffer that condemnation, but has passed from death into life. Whereas we were in a state of living spiritual death, we come to a state of living in spiritual life. That's why Jesus said to suffering Christians who were being persecuted and killed for their faith in the book of Revelation, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died. And behold, I'm alive evermore, and I have the keys to death in Hades. I have conquered death in my resurrection. Therefore, if you die, I can get you out. I will raise you up. 
So again, this is completely unique to Christianity, that God would become human, that he would die giving his life for us. No other religion has an answer for evil like the Bible. No other God in any other religion has died and been raised to ensure our eternal life. So what sets the life promises of Jesus apart from everyone else who promises life to you, who promises to be the answer to all your problems? Well, no one else is the eternal word through whom the whole universe was made. No one else became the suffering servant who shared in all of your human suffering. No one else died as the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the whole world. No one else was raised as the triumphant king who can save us from spiritual death. And so he has the right to command our destiny. He has the right to bid us to come and die to ourselves so that we can actually live for him. Let's end with a a poem here. From the perspective of Jesus, I am the resurrection life. It's not as though I merely bear life-giving drink, a magic elixir, which men might think is cheap because though lavish, it's not bought. The price of life was fully paid. I fought with death and black despair, for I'm the drink of life. The resurrection mourns the link between my death and endless lifelong sought. I am the firstborn from the dead, and by my triumph I deal with death to lusts and hates. My life I now extend to men and ply them with the draft that ever satiates. I like this bit. Religion's page with empty boasts is rife, but I'm the resurrection and the life. Well, what do you think? Are you convinced? Do you need more convincing? If this is hitting home with you and you see the the truth of what Scripture teaches of Jesus, I just encourage you to keep following, keep enduring, live faithfully, allow that death and that resurrection to shape your life. And if you're a Christian, that means you've already been buried with Him in baptism and raised with Him to newness of life, and you are living with Him even now though you die someday. But if you're not a Christian, I just encourage you to think more seriously about the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus. And this merits some kind of response from you. Are you going to choose life by choosing Him? Are you going to choose death? Let us know how we can help you as we stand and sing.